Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Wherever you are in the world, I hope you are healthy and safe. My name is Randy Bell, and I am the director of the Atlanta Council Global Energy Center and the Richard Morningstar Chair for Global Energy Security. Thank you for joining us today for what promises to be a fantastic discussion, leading oil and gas into a net zero world. Even as the world pursues decarbonization and emission reduction, in the pursuit of net zero emissions, oil and gas will continue to play a significant role in the energy system well into the future. It's crucial, therefore, that oil and the oil and gas industry play a leadership role in reaching net zero. Our event today aims to bring together a distinguished panel to discuss exactly what the state of the oil and gas industry's movement towards net zero is, the geopolitical implications, and the greater role of oil and gas in a net zero future. I have the distinct honor of welcoming three great friends uh, to, uh, to the program today. We have His Excellency Mohammed Barkindo, Secretary General of the Organization of the Petroleum Exporting Countries. We have Majid Jaffer, Chief Executive Officer of Crescent Petroleum, and Halima Croft, Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. The panel is also the official launch of the Global Energy Center's new oil and gas net zero project, which I think we're gonna hear more about today. Um, but before we get started, I have just a few reminders. First, you can follow us on Twitter at AC Global Energy and use the hashtag AC Energy. Second, after our speaker's remarks, you can submit questions through the Q&A function on Zoom. If you're watching on another platform like YouTube, unfortunately, we can't take your questions. Finally, I wanted to note that uh, I am coming to you from the new Atlantic Council studio in Washington, D.C., with our moderator and one of our panelists here, and uh, two others uh, coming in virtually, coming in remote. Uh, we'll be doing more and more of these hy hybrid programs going forward, so we think this is a really, really exciting format and uh, the, the future of, of convening. So with that, uh, I'd like to turn it over to our moderator for today, Alex Dewar, Senior Director of the Center for Energy Impact with the Boston Consulting Group. Alex, thanks so much for being here today. Thank you so much, Randy. Well, this is such an exciting panel, as you said, and there is so much to cover, especially coming off of Climate Week last week. So let's get right into the opening remarks. Um, Your Excell Excellency, Mohammed Barkindo, please, uh, would you kick us off? Uh, good morning to all our friends uh, on the other side of the Atlantic, and good afternoon to all our friends and colleagues uh, here in Europe and beyond. It's also a great pleasure to once again share a panel with these uh, distinguished colleagues, uh, Helima Croft, RBC Capital, and Majid Jafar of Crescent uh, Petroleum. It looks quite a while that uh, since we last uh, met physically, but I'm very pleased uh, and very delighted that Atlantic Council is able to provide us with this platform. Uh, Helima and uh, Majid are well known to everyone around the world, they are industry thought leaders and passionate about what they do. At OPEC, we always uh, welcome uh, engagements and conversations uh, with these two guys. It is also a pleasure to share a platform with our moderator, Alex, a Senior Director, Center for Energy Impact at Boston Consulting Group. I will once again thank Atlantic Council uh, Global Energy Center uh, for this invitation to join this panel focused on leading oil and gas into a net zero world. This comes on the back of your excellent uh, 2020 report, looking at the role of oil and gas companies in the energy transition and its uh, new oil and gas net zero project uh, that Alex just made reference to. The 2020 report looks at the challenges as well as the opportunities for the oil and gas industry in the energy transition as the world looks to simultaneously meet uh, decarbonization goals and expected oil and gas demand. What is clear is that our industry has to engage with other stakeholders, investors, governments, and the general public. We need to make our voices heard, highlight what our industry is doing to reduce emissions, and emphasize just how important oil and gas will be in the energy transition in both the developing and developed world. This will be vital for investments into the industry 
particularly given uh, the ESG and the climate disclosure drive from the financial community. Here, we also need to be cognizant of the implications of underinvestment. This has been exacerbated by the COVID-19 pandemic with oil industry investments declining by nearly 30%. A shortfall in investments could cause volatility in market, particularly if supply falls and demand does not, and we could see crude oil and product shortages, all of which would have an impact on the global economy. We need to be wary of what I might term unintended consequences, which can be viewed in the current gas turmoil, particularly here in Europe. Given that we only have time for short introductions, allow me to give a brief overview of OPEC's position on the energy transition and the net zero goals. We need to transition to a more inclusive and equitable world in which every person has access to energy. A sustainable development goal number seven of the UN ensures access to affordable, reliable, sustainable and modern energy for all. We in OPEC, we fully support the science. And what science tells us is that we have to reduce emissions. OPEC remains fully engaged and supportive of the UNFCCC and the Paris Agreement. The challenge of tackling emissions has many parts as evidenced by the IPCC. It is not just one part for all, whether that be a country or an industry. It is important to recognize that achieving net zero emissions by 2050, as some countries are now focusing on, is an extremely challenging goal, even for advanced economies. This further underlines the massive challenges for developing countries to reach net zero, many of whom are focused on such issues as energy access, living wages, and supplying basic necessities. It is clear the oil and gas industries are part of the solution. We possess vital resources and expertise that can help unlock an emissions-free future. OPEC supports innovation and technological advancement, and they need to look for clean and more efficient technological solutions across all available energies. We are believers that solutions can be found in technologies, such as carbon capture, utilization, and sequestration, as well in energy efficiency measures and the promotion of the circular carbon economy, which received the endorsement of the G20 under the presidency of the Kingdom of Saudi Arabia, one of our members. It is our, our deeply held conviction that dialogue on this matter should be inclusive and broad to try and evolve this energy transition in the least disruptive manner. I thank you for your attention and I look forward uh, to our discussions. Thank you very much for your remarks. And um, uh, Majid, I uh, want to turn it over to you next. Um, really excited to hear your perspectives as an operator and understand you've got some great news to share as well on this topic. Thank you. It's great to be, uh, to be with you all. And uh, I hope, again, we can meet in person soon. So I think on this important question of oil and gas uh, and the role of the sector in the energy transition. I totally echo uh, what my brother, His Excellency Mohammed Markendo, has just said. There is a vital role to be played. And I fear that the sort of unfair malignment and, and uh, the disinvesting uh, campaign from the sector is actually going to uh, end up hurting the efforts to achieve a successful and equitable and just uh, energy transition. I think as companies, as operators, there are two important things we need to bear in mind. One is what we do, uh, our processes. Um, just as an example, we are, we've been in business 50 years now. We've been gradually transitioning more and more to natural gas, which now makes up 85% of our uh, total production. Uh, we have made a concerted effort to bring down our flaring by over 80% in recent years, and it's now just 0.12% of total production, and we're still pushing that down towards zero. And a lot of those efforts were actually profitable uh, efforts. 
So we've achieved the carbon intensity of six kilos of CO2 per barrel of oil equivalent, which is a third of the uh, industry average. And then other things like eliminating single-use uh, plastics as part of our sustainability strategy. And then we offset the remaining uh, emissions with carbon credits supporting wind power in places like China and Mongolia and replacing uh, the burning of coal to achieve, and I'm pleased to announce this here at this uh, meeting, uh, that we've achieved carbon neutrality across our uh, operations. In other words, net zero production. And that's not to boast, but just to describe and explain how, as operators in the industry, we can make important efforts uh, in this regard in terms of improving our process and, and what we do. The other important part, though, is why we do it and explaining our products and their vital role in the energy transition. And I feel this is often uh, neglected. First of all, on oil, in any net zero scenario in 2050, whichever one you take, there's going to be an important role for oil. And even if uh, light passenger transportation, i.e. cars, is fully electrified, uh, there's still an important role for oil in heavy transport, whether it's trucking, uh, 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 you know, air transportation and freight, shipping, until cleaner technologies, whether they're hydrogen or gas-based, uh, are developed. There will be an important role for oil. But actually, the fastest growing uh, market for oil is in the petrochemical sector and making stuff. I think people out there underappreciate to what extent we all depend upon oil in everyday life and everything around us. Just as an example, during the COVID pandemic, almost everything we've come to rely on from the screens upon which we are watching this uh, panel right now uh, to uh, smartphones, the masks, the sanitizers, and even every vaccine has glycol as a stabilizing agent. Literally everything uh, is a downstream product of the petroleum sector. And so the idea that somehow we don't need oil because we have electrical, electric vehicles, the electric vehicles themselves are actually made of oil. Uh, so I think that's underappreciated. And then on natural gas, it's a vital fuel for electricity and industry. It is a necessary complement to uh, renewables because we cannot store renewable power to this day. And therefore, we have inter intermittency and reliability challenge. And it is also the path towards the future hydrogen economy, which will start with uh, blue hydrogen and, and then getting to uh, green uh, hydrogen. So I think we need to do a better job as the industry, as operators, of explaining not only how we're improving what we're doing, but how the products of our sector are going to be uh, vital in this transition. Thank you so much, Majid. Um, and last but not least, Halima, very excited to hear your uh, thoughts. You watch this industry, seeing everything that's been happening, uh, such dramatic progress on this in the last couple of years. Um, please. No, I think this is such a great time to be having this conversation because we're going into COP26, but we're also in the midst of a really profound energy crisis in Europe at the moment. And real question marks for policymakers about what do you do in the near term to prepare your populations for an energy transition? And what type of investments do you need? And I think this is going to be a profound debate. I mean, there's real question marks about, can you even get enough gas into Europe? What if you have a particularly cold winter? You know, do you have a public health crisis there? And the question is, you know, do you need important, you know, backups like natural gas? I mean, how are you going to deal with issues of coal displacement without natural gas? And I think policymakers in the West are not clear at this moment about how much they want to support this industry. But consumers in Europe, I think, could have a real revolt against this sort of net zero agenda if they don't have important energy access issues. So I do think it's a, a really important inflection moment. And I think about, you know, we're sitting in Washington right now, and the Biden administration has really made, you know, the net zero imperative, a key part of its whole policy agenda, whole government approach. 
But we've recently seen, as you know, WTI prices, they actually just hit $75. I mean, the highest we've seen since 2018. We've seen increasing calls from this administration for more oil from OPEC. And that's raising, you know, interesting policy debates in this country about, you know, we have resources here, do we support the industry here? Or do we simply say, you know, we're going to ask, you know, foreign governments to produce oil? And so I do think that this is a really interesting inflection point for governments as we go into COP26 because they're trying to sort of navigate, you know, getting, you know, everybody mobilized around this while at the same time ensuring that consumers have access to affordable energy. And it is not an easy line to walk is what they're finding out. Great. Well, the policy point is a absolutely critical one. Um, we're now uh, going to turn to questions, so please, audience members, submit your questions. Um, but I really want to keep on that trend of talking policy uh, because it is central to all of this, of promoting uh, an energy transition uh, in first and foremost, but also ensuring it's as stable as possible. Uh, so, Your Excellency, I, I would like to turn to you um, and uh, hear your thoughts uh, as we come up to COP26, such a, a pivotal period for continuing to advance global action on climate change and advanced global policies. Um, what are your views uh, around what types of policies governments should be prioritizing to both address climate change, but as you've pointed out, ensure that there is a stable energy transition, that investment is sustained, and uh, ultimately that we have uh, stability, uh, equity, and uh, prosperity through that process? Uh, thank you very much uh, for this very, very important question. But before then, I want to state as follows, that we in OPEC, we welcome the return of the United States to the Paris Agreement. Without the US in the Paris Agreement, its implementation will remain a pipe dream. Now, going forward into COP26, under the leadership of the leading uh, countries of the world that put together this convention, uh, the UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, which is basically the Bible of this conversation. We in OPEC Seems we may have frozen here. So uh, uh, let's, let's continue on, and we'll certainly come back to uh, His Excellency here in a moment when uh, our internet glitches um, get, get fixed here. Um, we, have, we, have, we have seen the setting aside of the convention itself, uh, its uh, sister protocol, and the reports of the IPCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. We have seen this conversation, as I have said previously, being gradually driven by emotions, by distortions, and complete misrepresentation of the science and the facts. Therefore, we cannot go into COP26 with the high expectations the global community puts on this important COP uh, with such a divided world. Uh, the U.S. needs to take the lead in bringing everybody on board, bringing all stakeholders, be they developed or developing countries, be they emitters, consumers, producers. We need that coalition that the U.S. led in Paris uh, to return in Glasgow because the outcome of Glasgow must be all-inclusive. It must be comprehensive. It must be sustainable. Uh, going forward. And I can tell you here in OPEC, we are hopeful that finally we would be able to come back to the mainstream, I mean the whole world, uh, and focus on the fundamental objective of this conversation, bringing down emissions, cutting down greenhouse gas emissions. The transition it's not about crowding out some sources of energy, be they hydrocarbons or fossil fuels. Tomorrow, we are going to launch our World Oil Outlook 2021. And I can share with you uh, some of the highlights. 
energy demand growth will be in the region of 28% between now and 2045. In terms of oil, it will translate to about 25 million barrels cumulatively going forward. In terms of the global economy, we see the global economy doubling in size from what it is now to 2045. A population that will drive part of this growth, we expect 20% growth in population, nearly 1.8 billion people coming into this world. And the vast majority, nearly 80% plus, will come from the poor developing countries that are now facing another pandemic other than COVID, which is energy poverty. The numbers here are staggering. Despite all the efforts that governments around the world have been deploying in order to combat energy poverty, we still have over 800 million people in this world in developing countries who have no access to energy, to electricity. In Africa, where I come from, in Sub-Saharan Africa in particular, nearly 600 million people have no access to electricity. In terms of access to clean cooking fuels, out of the nearly 2.6 billion that the IEA uh, says have no access around the world, 900 million people come from Sub-Saharan Africa. Therefore, all sources of energy will be required for the foreseeable future. What is required is the deployment of appropriate technologies supported by appropriate policy measures, by governments, by corporations, and to carry civil society along. We believe that it is doable, especially with the return of the U.S. to the head of the table. Thank you, Your Excellency. And on that specific point of the U.S. at the head of the table, um, Halima, I'd like to get your views on this. Uh, we see a, a range of foreign policy here from the Biden administration and so forth. On the one hand, of course, uh, an aggressive push right out the gate around climate diplomacy, engaging in COP26. At the same time, uh, recently also yes. asking, asking for more, right? <laughs> uh, what should we look forward to from Washington going forward and, and really balancing the needs of the long-term uh, you know, imperative action on climate with energy markets? This, since? I think, is the biggest challenge for policymakers right now is they have these incredibly ambitious, necessary net zero goals. And yet, in the near term, you do not have a situation where you can have renewables providing anything close to 100% of you know, power generation needs that people need. And so the question is, do you have enough you know, investment to ensure that you can fill this gap, which could be for you know, a significant period? And we're already, again, I mean, I look at what's happening in Europe and worry that this may be the sort of shape of things to come. You know, we're basically hoping that Europe does not have a profoundly cold winter because, again, it could have a serious public health crisis if you have people, you know, essentially not able to heat their homes. I mean, you're having really serious shortages in a number of countries. And the question is, can you bring your population along with these really ambitious climate goals if they don't feel like they're having their everyday needs being met. And again, we're really seeing this here as well. I actually thought it was quite stunning that you had the, the commentary coming out of you know, the administration this summer imploring OPEC for more barrels. I mean, OPEC had already agreed to do a, you know, a very sort of modest what the market needed in terms of putting an additional 400,000 barrels per month on the market. But this administration, the National Security Advisor, you know, issued a call for more OPEC barrels to essentially help lower gasoline prices. And again, I think that is going to be a real political challenge because opponents of the Biden administration on Capitol Hill said, well, we actually have a domestic oil and gas industry. Um, are you going to support that? And so I do think that finding a way that you can continue to make the investments that are necessary to deal with the near-term needs 
while you know focusing on the policies you need to put in place to reach these net zero goals. Like that is going to be the challenge for the administration. And you even think about Washington right now. One topic that doesn't seem to be gaining a lot of traction on Capitol Hill is like you know price for carbon. And so again, another politically challenging issue, but potentially very necessary. Can you reach net zero without a price for carbon? Great points. And uh, a central thread in all of this, of course, is natural gas. <laughs> um, we've heard it raised several times, and, and Halima, you know, you, you rightly pointed out, uh, I think whereas gas is assumed to play a very you know, stable and reliable role, uh, currently what we're seeing in, in Europe um, and the volatility we've seen over the last year uh, has uh, not been what many expected. Um, so Majid, really want to bring you on on this and get your perspective. Um, you know, wh what is the role of gas in the energy transition and how uh, do policymakers, especially in Europe and in North America here, uh, balance uh, the need for uh, using gas as a transition fuel, um, but really uh, ultimately achieving the deployment of the long-term decarbonization technologies like CCUS, hydrogen, and others uh, that, that will be needed? Sure. So all those technologies that, that you uh, mentioned are still a long way off from, from uh, being able to be uh, deployed at scale. So there's a lot of R&D that's needed. In terms of natural gas, uh, as I said earlier, it's a vital complement to renewables and enabler of renewables. That's how the United Kingdom, the United States have brought down uh, emissions to decades low levels and enabled the renewable sectors, whereas the countries that have tried to ignore the, the need for natural gas and its supporting infrastructure are now facing the crises that uh, Halima uh, alluded to. The wind didn't blow in Europe and, it, and, and, and Asia needed more gas and suddenly there's a serious uh, crisis. And it is a very important contributor to reducing emissions. Just one example, our own uh, natural gas production in the Middle East region over the last decade, by displacing diesel, liquid fuels, has enabled the savings of 42 million tons of CO2. That's equivalent to taking a million cars off the road. And in fact, worldwide, industry-wide, uh, over the last five years, natural gas displacing coal has had a hundred times bigger impact on reducing emissions than all the electric cars in the world. Uh, you know, it, it, it would be like taking all the cars in China and the United States and making them clean renewables immediately at the push of a button. That's the effect, the positive effect that natural gas has had. But it is being unfairly maligned. And as, as we heard from Halima, there's a bit of schizophrenia on the one hand, you know, lumping all fossil fuels together, which is, which is wrong because this, what's happening between the fossil fuels is, is really very important and may, maybe the most important. And at the same time, asking OPEC for more oil and asking Russia for more uh, gas in the short term. Now, oil is largely produced by governments, the majority by governments and national oil companies. It's easy to store and, and in that sense, more, more fungible. You can store it, transport it. Natural gas, by contrast, it, the majority is produced by the private sector, uh, and a lot of investment is needed in transportation and pipelines, and it's not as easy to, to transport and, and, and store. And so without that investment, uh, you, you're going to continue having these crises. And I tell you why I'm, I'm very concerned about it, because it will undermine the whole effort to tackle climate change. As Halima said, this could be the sign of things to come, more backlashes, more blackouts. And we are having now a world of the haves and the have-nots. We had it with COVID, where those less well-off in developed countries suffered more in terms of jobs and education than those better off. And those in developing countries are left with no vaccines at all. We can't have a similar issue with climate policy, where those in developing country, developed countries suffer by paying much higher energy costs than they can bear, because it's essentially regressive taxation. And those in developing countries don't have energy at all, as His Excellency uh, um, mentioned in terms of the energy poverty. If we look at the UN SDGs, and we've just had the, uh, the General Assembly, these were a number of issues that the world needs to tackle. If you are in a rich country, then maybe climate change is the only one that affects you and your life in Europe or the United States. But if you are in the majority uh, of the world, where the majority of the world's population lives, then they all matter. 
you know, poverty matters, health matters, education matters, and energy access matters hugely. But what I'm seeing, unfortunately, from the West, if you like, the, the richer part of the world, is neglecting all the developmental aspects. And some elements of the climate movement are even anti-development, with just sole focus on the climate change. What you're going to have is more burning of coal, because it's the cheapest, uh, and you're seeing it even in Europe now, when the gas price went higher. And so higher emissions. So it's, it's not only unjust, but it's actually self-defeating if we are really going to tackle climate change. Thank you, Majid. Um, and following that further, that, that question of, of gas and uh, especially the finance uh, that's needed for it, the capital that's needed for it, taking a question from the audience here um, to Your Excellency, uh, raising this, this question of uh, balancing uh, climate uh, near-term energy needs and enabling the role of gas in the longer term, um, looking at, at petrostates, um, uh, balancing, uh, of course, their need to continue producing natural gas, to ex extend access to natural gas, most of the, uh, the growth in natural gas consumption uh, globally, almost all of it is really coming from developing countries. Um, with Europe and uh, North America, uh, moving to constrain access to capital around natural gas uh, through various policy measures. What are the options? Um, where is the capital going to come from, especially around this topic of uh, producing gas and supplying it to the developing country to enable energy access, as you've pointed out, uh, is, is, which is such a critical priority? We were, taken, we were taken aback when we saw the report from the IEA on their path for net zero, especially the aspect related to investment in this industry. Uh, we have had a very uh, good working relationship with the IEA for many years. Uh, we see eye to eye on so many of these issues, uh, particularly supply demand fundamentals. We both agree that demand for energy will continue to grow. Demand for oil will continue to grow. We all agree that uh, uh, the scourge is not just of climate, but of energy poverty. There are two sides of the same coin and that there is need to address both by the global community. But when this report came out, especially on investments, uh, when we are emerging gradually from the worst uh, pandemic in generations, when we saw uh, capital investments in our industry shrunk by nearly 30% in one year. And we have not yet recovered from the two consecutive years of massive investment contractions in 2015, 2016. If you recall of nearly 27% for each of those two years. And now to compound the situation, uh, the impacts of COVID on investments last year. And here you are faced with a new challenge uh, in a new frontier uh, that is being championed uh, by many around the world. The time has come to stop investments completely in this industry. Now, it is perplexing to say the least because we know it's simple arithmetic is non-nuclear science that there is no one single source of energy that will replace oil and gas for the foreseeable future. Over 50% of the global energy mix will be accounted for by oil and gas. Oil will account for about 28% in our world oil output that we will release tomorrow here in Vienna. Uh, gas will be in the region of 24 to 25%. Now, no single source or group of renewable or alternative sources of energy will replace uh, these valuable sources of energy. Yet, at the moment, as we have said, we are facing energy poverty in the vast countries of the developing world. What you read and hear one, what is happening in the UK and many parts of Europe probably is new to them. But this is what people, billions of people around the world live day after day. Therefore, we need 
to get our acts together, either as policymakers or as industry chieftains, in order to come back to reality. We need to encourage investment in this industry in order to meet current and future demand. But the challenge of decarbonization, of reducing greenhouse gas emissions, cannot be addressed by stopping investment in the industry. To the contrary, what we need is more investments that will also cover technology to address these emissions. Well, the carbon capture and sequestration technologies may be music for the future in terms of global mass utilization, but at least it is an important and a fundamental positive step going forward. Our industry has always been an industry that is driven by technology. Therefore, we want to call on the global investment community, on the banking and financial industry to rethink and revisit their disclosure constraints on the industry. We are part of the solution and our industry is capable of collaborating with the technological giants of this world to address the challenge of greenhouse gas emissions so that we will have a better world. We in the developing countries, we leave the impact of climate change on daily basis. And yet we are also compounded with this acute nearly pandemic situation of access uh, to energy. Despite the resolution of the United Nations, the General Assembly is ongoing and we are following very, very closely from here in Vienna. We hear less about the SDG 7. We hear more about climate. But the challenge of climate can only be addressed if it is all inclusive. Thank you. And, and sticking on the topic of capital allocation, um, Majid, as an operator, uh, you are accustomed to the regular challenge of mobilizing and allocating capital in this. Uh, curious to get your perspective on, on an audience question here, uh, focused on where does the capital come from to finance the long-term energy transition while maintaining the necessary capacity to produce oil and gas in the short term? Yeah, so I think it's a great question, and uh, I'm building on what's been said. It is a concern. I mean, from, from my own selfish perspective, uh, I know the demand will continue to grow. So if there are fewer in, uh, investors, I will make higher returns. Uh, but my bigger concern is for the world at large, and particularly the developing world, which will be the most to suffer. Ultimately, Europe and the United States are post-industrial economies that have had falling emissions for a long time. So if they want to spend a trillion dollars at home or a trillion euros for a green deal, that's great. But so far, as we've seen, the hundred billion, which is nowhere near enough, that was pledged in Paris for the developing world has not been uh, uh, paid up. So there is this neglect that's happening for the, for the developing uh, world. And this idea of bashing the industry and disinvesting, that somehow if the sources of capital in Western markets just don't invest uh, in the sector, that's going to help. That's going to hurt. That's going to hurt in terms of development in the developing world. And that's actually going to hurt in terms of achieving cleaner energy outcomes because there'll be more burning of dirtier uh, fuels and because it's cheaper. Uh, and that's kind of what's going on. I mean, for me, the idea of blaming the oil and gas sector uh, for the climate change is would be like blaming... Uh, sugar farmers and wheat farmers for obesity. It is all of our responsibility as consumers. You can't just starve the investment from the production when the demand, you know, at the moment they're trying to starve the supply of money while the demand continues to grow. And that is very uh, dangerous. Uh, I mean, when it comes to energy and the products from oil and gas, it is every single one of us that's a consumer and big industries like agriculture, like cement, steel, uh, you know, all heavy uh, industries, they are the ones that are consuming and emitting. 
Uh, so there needs to be reform across the board, and it will take time. But in the meantime, the fastest way to enable Asia to wean off coal, which is really what the challenge is about, it's not about Europe or the United States, frankly, uh, natural gas will play a big part of that, needs to play a big part of that, along with renewables. Otherwise, we're just going uh, in, in a dangerous direction, as we have glimpsed in Europe in the, in the last few weeks. Thanks, Majid. Um, and so far, we haven't really discussed the role of IOCs, which David Goldwyn in the questions yeah. uh, uh, rightly noted. Uh, so, Halimba, want to turn to you on this. Uh, David's question really is focused on the role of ESG pressures. And uh, as uh, we see ESG pressure mount on IOCs to address climate solutions like hydrogen and, and CCS, uh, do you expect them to advocate more robustly for carbon pricing uh, to create the commercial terms, the platform uh, to decarbonize and enable the energy transition? No, absolutely. We're already seeing major IOCs really leading on the issue of carbon pricing, essentially saying, look, you absolutely have to have a price for carbon if you're going to reach these goals. And I, that's why I brought up the issue of the United States. And I, I think it is striking that we are really not seeing a real movement in Congress to really bring up the issue of carbon pricing because, you know, you do have key sectors, you know, industry, you talk to airline CEOs, you know, saying we need a price for carbon. So I do think that is something that policymakers are going to have to grapple with in this country. But I actually want to pick up on the issue of who's going to continue to invest. I mean, you do have certain IOCs like Total Energies is just out with their you know, massive new investment in Iraq, but it's an all of the above investment. It's in you know, oil, gas, and solar. I do think though, when you want to think about you know, who's going to continue to invest with ESG mandates growing, it's going to be national oil companies. It's going to be national oil companies that are going to basically say, we have the lowest cost of production. Um, and they also say that if you look at you know, the sort of emissions footprint per barrel, we're on the low end of that spectrum as well. So I do think what's really interesting is, is that you had, you know, with the Shell Revolution, questions about were OPEC producers best days you know, behind them. You had questions just a few years ago, have we reached peak demand? Now I think as we think about energy transitions and you know, who can continue to invest, and again, who's sitting on the lower emissions barrels, you know, those barrels tend to come out of the Middle East. And so I do think that you have a select set of national oil companies saying, you know what, we're preparing for the future where the low cost producer wins and the low emissions producer wins. And so I do think you're going to see certain national oil companies continue to invest in upstream. You look at capacity expansion plans from Adnoc, from Saudi Aramco, they will continue to invest, but they will also invest in hydrogen. They will say, we have best economics for hydrogen. They will continue to invest in natural gas. They will continue to do you know, solar projects as well. They will be the all of the above investors. And so I do think that's raising really interesting questions politically for you know, Western nations as well, who you know, now will be looking at, I think, a future where you will continue to have investment, but it will be a, a smaller set of producers that will invest. And even if the pie starts to shrink, you will have a smaller number of players really dominating that pie. Halima, you raise a great point here around IOCs uh, ultimately have the flexibility, they have degrees of freedom around their portfolio uh, to change uh, what their capital allocation approach is, um, to shift the assets they have, uh, whereas national oil companies, of course, do not. Uh, so uh, they operate in one, one geographic context um, and they operate with a certain mandate to maximize the value of their hydrocarbons. And you could yeah. also say that if you're a national oil company, though, you have more sort of flexibility to continue to pursue certain investments, I think, which is really interesting. Again, when we think about particularly upstream investments for oil, you know, those will be that companies that will continue to invest because they say we, we have best economics. We have the, you know, we look at our emissions footprint per barrel. We don't face the type of shareholder pressure. So we can continue to make those investments. Right. Well, again, investing in gas, investing in hydrogen, investing in solar. So I do think that this is a, a situation going forward, at least in the near and medium term, where a certain select set of national oil companies are looking at a potentially very bright future. Interesting. So building on that, I want to turn to Your Excellency um, on this question, uh, surveying uh, your, your OPEC members, um, national oil companies overall. Um, what is the pathway going forward to ensure 
uh, again, that they're maximizing uh, the value and return to uh, their, pub the, 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 their populations, their public, uh, as well as uh, ensuring that there's the right investment and preparation uh, to transition for the long term for a net zero world. I think the, there is a growing consensus that uh, there is no one single pathway. There are many pathways. I think even the IEA, to be fair to them, in this their net zero scenario, uh, they talked about a pathway, not the pathway. Uh, this uh, multiplicity of paths reflects the reality of our world. Uh, it is a world uh, that is currently uh, divided, uh, does not have uh, the consensus that is required uh, to take this major uh, global uh, policy measures in a multilateral fashion. We do acknowledge that uh, the great powers uh, and countries around the world are trying their best uh, to come back to multilateralism once again. And uh, the uh, return to or the gravitation that we see of countries both developed and developing to the implementation of the Paris Agreement as uh, probably uh, the most feasible path at the moment uh, to address the challenge of our time, which is uh, climate uh, together with the energy uh, poverty gives us some hope uh, that uh, probably the worst is over and probably Glasgow will be the turning point, uh, not the inflection point, as uh, Secretary General Guterres uh, likes to say. Uh, but we in OPEC and our national oil companies will continue to invest in this industry. 80% or more of proven reserves of oil reside in our member countries. In terms of energy poverty, we come from the regions of the world where it is, to say the least, an endemic. Therefore, we're looking at the future. We are looking at medium to long term. As I made reference to several in our discussions uh, today, in our world oil outlook that will be launched tomorrow, the industry will require nearly 12 trillion US dollars between now and 2045 in order to recover from what we have lost 2015, 2016, two consecutive years of contraction in investments of cumulatively over 50%. And the year of COVID, 2020, about 30% contraction. So where are we going to get these huge capital investments? From the governments or from the global financial markets? I think it's obvious that both will have to uh, play their part. The global financial markets cannot afford to crowd out this industry going forward. Uh, in terms of the need to maintain adequate supplies, to guarantee security of supplies from medium to long term, right now and even in the short term, you have made reference and both my brother Maji and uh, my sister Alima had made, they made reference to the near chaos that we are facing here in Europe in terms of uh, energy access and supply. So it is coming home to roost, if you like. Therefore, we sincerely hope that the global community will speak in one voice in Glasgow. Uh, they will come back to the convention itself, to the UNFCCC convention that gave birth to Paris that gave birth to Paris, so that we can get everybody on board. I think we can have a win-win situation. 
post Glasgow. I think there is uh, sufficient goodwill and uh, gravitas. We've got another uh, internet glitch here, so maybe we'll we'll continue for a moment and and come back. We'll see if it it restarts here. But uh, 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 I want to pick up on another another uh, thread here. Uh, Halima, you raised the point about emissions intensity. Um, Majid, at the outset, uh, you talked about what uh, Crescent Petroleum has been doing to reduce emissions intensity. Um, would like to take a step back for a second here and 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 ask you, Majid, about. Uh, what role really the oil and gas industry plays in their own scope one and two emissions uh, and how firmer, uh, stronger emissions targets within the industry uh, can really create progress here? Because I think it is this, this point of capital allocation. I think there is uh, likely a consensus now that uh, improving your own operations, especially on a scope one and two emissions basis, is foundational uh, to really having the license to, to mobilize and allocate capital in other ways. Uh, so from your own experience, uh, how significant is the role of oil and gas scope one and two emissions? Um, and how can companies uh, take action on that in a value accretive way, not just seeing carbon as a cost? So uh, it, it very definitely is an important starting point, And I, I described our own uh, journey with that. Uh, and it was profitable in, in most cases, and, and particularly in terms of reducing leakages and flaring and, and uh, and gas is an important um, sales product for us. My concern, though, is what I've been seeing uh, is it's no longer just about uh, how we do what we do uh, and, and actually the very existence of the industry or investing in the industry, as His Excellency mentioned, is being uh, maligned. Uh, so it's kind of gone beyond that. Uh, I, uh, I hear his optimism about uh, COP26 um, I have my concerns, uh, and I, I think it's high time that political leaders in the rich West speak the truth, which is that we cannot today have a 100% renewables-based energy system, period, because you can't store re renewables energy, and so when the sun doesn't shine or the wind doesn't blow, you have a problem. So what are the cleaner forms no energy is fully clean, even renewables, but cleaner forms than, for example, uh, coal or burning uh, dung and wood for cooking, as His Excellency mentioned, 3 billion people uh, do today. Uh, and unfortunately, the climate movement is maligning natural gas and nuclear energy, which are the two obvious, reliable, cleaner forms for baseload power, which could then enable uh, uh, more renewables. So what are really the options? And political leaders, whether it's the OPEC Secretary General or some in the administration uh, and certainly in Europe, are unfortunately feeding this myth that somehow we don't need fossil fuels or they're a temporary uh, uh, bridge fuel uh, and we can have 100% renewables. The reality is we can't today, but it's almost academic debate in the West. What's important is in the developing world. The developing world will not tolerate being told you can have a solar panel and a battery and you don't need reliable grid power as we in the richer countries have come to rely upon and depend upon. It just won't fly. And so they will continue burning the cheapest option, which in many cases in Asia is coal. Uh, and emissions uh, keep going up. So there really needs to be a concerted global effort. Carbon pricing would be great, but I recognize Halima's point. I mean, the U.S. Congress can't even agree on, on uh, paying its bill, uh, debts at the moment, let alone uh, a carbon tax, carbon pricing. But it is very important for incentivizing investment worldwide, but also important is serious amounts of aid to enable a fairer energy and cleaner energy transition in developing countries. And Alok Sharma has mentioned this, Boris Johnson has mentioned this, President Biden has mentioned this. So far, we haven't seen the real contributions. What we're seeing is um, this is a global commons problem, climate change and carbon emissions, but everybody's trying to solve it within their own national or regional boundaries and putting their own interests first. And that is normal. That's the multinational system in which we live. But therein lies the problem. 
Your Excellency, I, I want to come back to you uh, for a moment here. We have a few minutes left. Um, unfortunately, you cut out in, in part of the prior statement there. So uh, really, any, any closing thoughts from you here in the last few minutes, um, uh, especially coming back to this role of, of NOCs uh, in managing this transition? Uh, in conclusion, I would like to uh, sincerely uh, thank uh, Atlantic Council and my dear colleagues, uh, Alima and Majid, and your good self uh, for uh, putting together uh, this uh, uh, platform uh, today. Uh, I think it is timely uh, that such platforms uh, uh, should uh, uh, be made available for uh, contributors around the world, not just the three of us. I think Atlantic Council is doing a great job in that regard. The Energy Forum Global Energy Forum uh, that will convene in Abu Dhabi in January of next year. Timely coming after COP26 and hopefully, hopefully uh, after the pandemic uh, so that the world will converge in Abu Dhabi uh, to thoroughly look at where we came from uh, and try to chart a new path uh, going forward. We in OPEC, we remain optimistic uh, that the world working together uh, will uh, overcome uh, these challenges as huge as they look, as challenging and daunting as they are. I think the capability is there. I think the momentum is growing. Uh, uh, the political leaders of the world uh, should uh, take up these challenges and look at the time. The clock is ticking. And I think we can uh, all achieve the global success, especially in these two issues of climate and uh, energy poverty post-COVID, inshallah. Inshallah, indeed. Thank you. And uh, maybe to close here in the last, the last minute, Halima, Parting thoughts, uh, observing the industry and in, in all of this. Yeah, I mean, I, I such a delight today to be with the Secretary General and Majid. I have concerns like Majid about COP26 just in terms of, you know, the, the divergences that we see between you know, various nations in terms of what their net zero strategies are. We have you know, key players like Germany basically saying no on advanced civilian nuclear technology. Countries like Poland wanting that to be a centerpiece of their net zero strategy. You have countries like India essentially saying our net zero strategy is based you know, largely around natural gas. I mean, this is the key to coal displacement, but you have other key stakeholders saying no, natural gas should not be part of the solution because it's a fossil fuel. And the clock is ticking. And so I think that, you know, resolving these sort of you know, big divergences between the various national platforms for addressing climate change, there's really not a lot of time to get it done. And again, I, I fear a potential backlash brewing in terms of what we're seeing in terms of Europe. Well, thank you, Halima. Thank you, Majid. Thank you, Your Excellency. Um, we're at time here. And most importantly, thank you to the audience uh, for joining and participating in this robust discussion. Um, uh, and we'll talk to you all again very soon. Thank you. <laughs>